Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. So before we begin our third panel um, on navigating gender apartheid, the international law arena, I wanted to make a brief uh, comment, first of all. Um, we have had the privilege of hearing from uh, Dr. Sima Samar on the panel uh, earlier today. And just recently, um, she has published a book together with renowned Canadian journalist Sally Armstrong, who spent quite a bit of time in Afghanistan. Uh, and the book is called Outspoken. They are currently doing a book tour, in fact. So um, I do not get a commission for sales, but I would strongly uh, uh, encourage you to buy it uh, in any event if you want to understand uh, more the struggle of women in Afghanistan. Uh, secondly, before we begin our third panel, we have another short video. Uh, this one is focused on the women's rights movement in Iran. So I will uh, have you bear with us while we watch that, and, and then we will begin the third panel. Police. با استقرار گشت های خودرویی و پیاده در سراسر کشور علاوه بر انجام سایر معموریت های پلیسی با اون دسته از کسانی که متاسفانه توجهی به تبعات و عواقب پوشش خارج از عرف نداشتن و همچنان بر هنجار شکنی خودشون اصرار دارند ضمن انذار و تذکر در صورت عدم تمکین از دستورات پلیس برخورد قانونی و آنان را به دستگاه قضای معرفی خواهد دموکراسی از دروازه حقوق زن وارد ایران میشه We are now going to have a third panel navigating gender apartheid, the international law arena. The panel explores the intersection of gender-based persecution and apartheid in the context of international law. It explores the current and potential legal mechanisms that confront severe violations of women's rights. The discussion aims to pinpoint limitations and prospects for reinforcing international legal frameworks 
to improve accountability mechanisms for gender persecution and apartheid. And to moderate this session, we have um, my distinguished colleague, Professor Tavakoli Targhi, a senior fellow at Massey College and distinguished professor at University of Toronto that I've already had the privilege of uh, introducing. Mohammed, please. Thank you very much, John. Um, welcome, everyone, to Navigating Gender Apartheid the International Law Arena. We have a number of really distinguished practitioners of law on this uh, panel. And uh, I will very briefly introduce each person and then start the conversation. Uh, Catherine Hanifa uh, is the co chair of the International Dispute Resolution Group and the public international law group. So, there was an Plimpton LLP. She is the immediate past president of the American Society of International Law, ASIL, and currently is a member of the Council on Thank you. Foreign Relations and the U.S. State Department's Advisory Council on International Law and serves as a deputy chair of the high-level panel on media freedom. She's, she, ha, she also served as the counselor of international law and the U.S. State Department during the Obama administration, who I miss very much. And then, uh, the next speaker from Toronto is Professor Rebecca Cook, uh, Professor Emeritus and co-director of International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program, Faculty of Law, University of Toronto. She is the co-author of Gender Stereotyping, co-editor of Abortion Law in Transnational Re Perspective, and the editor of Frontiers of Gender Equality that was published by UPenn, University of Pennsylvania Press, in 2023. The other distinguished uh, member of the panel is Nushin Sarkarati, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the St Strategic Litigation Project, SLP, at the Atlantic Council, working on the intersection of law and policy on prevention and accountability for atrocity crimes and human rights violation. The SLP is behind an effort to codify gender apartheid and recently issued a joint letter and legal brief urging the international community to include gender apartheid in the UN's Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. The other distinguished member is Setare Ashraf. Sar Sarita, that's right, Setare. Sarita Ashraf. Uh, who is a barrister specializing in international criminal law with expertise in the gender component and intersectional analysis of international crimes. She's a senior consultant to the UN Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan, supporting work on his June 2024 report. She was also a senior legal consultant to the Atlantic Council's strategic litigation project, where she led the drafting of its legal brief setting, brief setting out the basis for the codification of the crime against humanity of gender apartheid. And finally, a person that we met earlier today, Professor Rangita de Silva de Alves, uh, is an expert member to the UN Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women Treaty Body and faculty at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She is a Hillary Rodman Clinton Global Fellow on Gender Equality, Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security Senior Fellow at Harvard Law School Center for Legal Profession. Thank you all for joining us. And um, as what has really guided me, and I want to show you this, is a book that was published in 1971 in Tehran with the title of Documents of Human Rights. And the English title is really interesting, Inst International Instruments of Human Rights. 
And what I want us to talk about are international instruments for advancing gender equality. At the heart of this is, of course, the United Nations Charter. And it is really important to note that it indicates that members of the United Nations affirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. So it's at the heart of the uh, UN Charter. There are a number of international, other really significant international resolutions. One of them was a resolution on December 26th, resolution 2028, that called, uh, 2081, that called to end all discriminations and denial of human rights and fundamental freedoms on grounds of race, color, sex, language, or religion. And I really think to, to develop this gender apartheid, that, that this uh, resolution 2081 would become, is really important. Another international do document that is important, and oddly, was part of an international UN conference held in Tehran in 19, May 1968. And some of the texts there are exceptional that for the discussion of gender equality and any kind of discrimination against based on gender uh, uh, culture and, and uh, very clearly that document that was drafted in Tehran uh, strongly condemned uh, South Africa. Of course, we are all familiar with uh, uh, Declaration on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women that was adopted in, uh, uh, in 1967, and also a Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women that was adopted uh, in, on December 18, 1979. And if you remember, that was at the heart, heart of the Iranian Revolution and it was the time that Islamic Republic is Islamist had taken charge and thus Iran was not a signatory to that. And uh, another really important uh, convention that will become part of this discussion of gender apartheid is the uh, 1973 uh, International Convention on the Punishment and, and the Crimes and Punishments of Apartheid. What is interesting South Africa, of course, voted against it at the UN. Guess who else voted against it? Do tell, who? Canada. Iran? No. Canada. Not Canada. No. United States and UK. The usual suspects on these kind of stuff. So that, that brings me to the discussion that we have. We have to really also be aware of the international lay of the land. And when we discuss gender apartheid, do it in a sense that you are also aware of the complexity of the international situation, international political games. And I want to turn to uh, our colleague uh, here, and uh, and uh, Catherine, uh, what are the instruments that we can use? How would you go about advancing uh, some sort of international recognition of uh, gender apartheid? And I have been encouraged to make this a flowing uh, uh, conversation, and I would be really grateful if my colleagues online could join us and jump in and continue the conversation. Wonderful, thank, thank you so much. It's such a salam, it's such a pleasure and privilege to be here with you today on, uh, on what is a bittersweet day for I know many of us. Uh, I was seven when I and my family were forced to flee Iran and the memories run deep of what it's like to feel alone and frightened with the world changing around you. And I suppose today in that bittersweet moment is to celebrate survivors, to celebrate resilience. And together, I think, um, is the key part of it. So for me, yes, there's bitterness because we are not anywhere near where we need to be. 
but there's also a sweetness in being here with you because it's that together piece. And if I hearken back to the poetry earlier, yes, we are candles, each of us are candles that burn in the night, but together we are an inferno. So to be here with you today is truly special. So you ask an easy question, <laughs> which is, what does international law do to solve, um, solve the predicament where we are? So I'm gonna do some table setting because as you say, it's important to understand where we have been to understand the challenges ahead, the progress and also the challenges and limitations. So what we have here is, I'd say, and I'll start with the punchline, yes, mechanisms of legal accountability and international law that are quite powerful. They resonate in human rights and gender equality and women's rights and girls' rights. And they're there, they are tools. They are not working as they should. And there is a profound failure in accountability. There's something that we need to be hopeful about, but also quite clear-eyed. So part of, I think, the discussion today is why? Because to understand why is to understand the way forward. And so I start with uh, one of the, the main aspects of this texture of the, the legal table setting, which is the crime of, germ of gender persecution. Relatively new, but I want to focus on the definition and talk about where gender apartheid fits in. So gender persecution is the intentional and severe deprivation of fundamental rights on the basis of gender. Where that can be established on a widespread or systematic manner associated with war crimes or other crimes under the Rome Statute, that rises to the level of a crime against humanity. That's part of the existing tapestry. And of course, when I say gender, I mean actual and perceived gender. I mean intersectionality from the perspective of gender doesn't stand alone, as we all know. Race, ethnicity, uh, economic class, all of this comes in together. But of course, as fluid as they are, gender is also uniquely situated in this, in this spectrum of rights. All of that is to say is that exists. And so sometimes you hear, well, why gender apartheid? Why do we need that? Why should we think about that as a forward moving measure? And the reason is because from my perspective that it is quite distinct. Gender apartheid, and we can talk about where these definitions come from, they draw from the, and per gender persecution draws from the Rome statute definition. Gender apartheid draws from the apartheid convention. It grows and it's expanded since in the, in the 35 plus years. But it's defined as inhumane acts, and I'll just say, committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one gender group over any other group or groups with the intention of maintaining that regime. That I think is probably the best and most classic definition of what we're talking about. And that is not gender persecution. Gender persecution, they are interrelated, there's complementarity there, but it is not the same thing. It is because of that institutionalization element and the, the, um, what that means is really a form of governance. What that means is what you've heard, for example, what the Taliban is doing is in every aspect of governance, every aspect of what it means to govern in the economic, in the social, in the religious, in the human rights sphere, there is systematic oppression against women and girls. And that is what constitutes gender apartheid as distinct. And sometimes you, thought, you hear about, well, it's the gravity of the crime, et cetera. But I would say, no, it's about that institutionalization element. And that is what makes it absolutely an imperative. So I wanted to talk about that and those differences because at the baseline, you always get the question, why do you need this? We need this because it's different. We need this because we see the intersectionality of what's going on in the world. We need this because it's yet another arrow in the quiver. So that gets us to where we are in terms of the shortcomings. I think, as I started with, there's a fundamental failure here. I'll talk about in two aspects. The first is, even where gender-based crimes are codified, they're often very little investigation, charging, prosecution around them. Why do I say this? It's because we have a classic example in the form of gender persecution. I was part of and lucky to be um, able to contribute to the ICC's policy on gender persecution, which many of you may have seen. It came out in December 2022, a very important step forward. How many gender um, prosecutions have there been for gender persecution since? Not even since, since it's been on the books in the Rome Statute. There's been two. Why is that? It, it's surely not because the facts didn't merit it. It's because there is a failure to focus on gender crimes. 
And that is a profound failure that we need to look straight in the eye and ask ourselves why. The policy in December 2022 is a step forward, but it's not going to get us all the way. And again, thinking through how, what does it mean to be underdeveloped? That takes us to gender apartheid. And I want to talk a little bit very briefly about where it could fit in the panoply of norms. So as many of you know in this room, use Kogan's norms, highest order legal norms in the international system, are norms that are owed erga omnes. Erga omnes partes erga omnes, meaning they're owed to the international community, they're owed by states regardless of the treaty aspects, regardless of other potential limitations on the ambit and jurisdiction of international law. So it's a very powerful concept. And here, in, as we all know, as we've all heard, gender apartheid has not been codified. It's obviously not in the Rome Statute. There's been a lot of language around it. I think that there's some very promising moves in the context of the draft Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. And on that, I, I certainly uh, would invite Nushin to, to um, speak to it. I think the Atlantic Council Litigation Project, for example, has done a tremendous job in suggesting a definition of apartheid that could go into the draft treaty that expands the classic definition to include gender. And it's not, and this is a very significant expansion of a definition. It doesn't require a separate crime. It doesn't require a massive modification. What it does is acknowledge what we know about gender-based crimes since the passage of the Rome Statute. And that's been, it's really an imperative, I think, for states and other organs of the United Nations to take this up. It has gained traction. We have seen more and more states use the terminology of gender apartheid, and I know there's a lot of complaints, rightly so, that international law is slow to move, it's slow to progress, it's slow to incorporate what we know uh, to meet the greatest problems of our day. But in this respect, there's been a real traction. You have the UN Secretary General using the term gender apartheid. You have all of these very important aspects and indications. So that's one piece, the crime against humanity. The ICC current uh, investigation in Afghanistan is broad enough to encompass the de facto de jure acts of the Taliban. And that requires evidence, it requires organization, it requires everyone in this room to assist in terms of bringing that evidence to bear in that process. And then the other um, avenue, and then I'll, we should um, allow others to speak, is through litigation. And so, for example, CEDAW, which many have hailed as the International Women's Bill of Rights, has yet to live up to its promise. It's been decades, and it has yet to live up to its promise. And one question in Afghanistan has ratified CEDAW with no reservations is, is that a path forward? And I think that there's a real merit to lots of conversations that I know you're aware of about a potential case. But there's also, I think, two cautions, I would say. One is that the voice of the women of Afghanistan must be heard. There are many aspects to that strategy that requires those voices to be paramount and to be put forward and at the front, at the face. And I think that is paramount in any potential claimant state consideration. The voices of the women must be heard and must lead the effort. And the second is that there's all kinds of thorny jurisdictional issues. For example, what does it mean to be in a dispute with the Taliban when it's not the authorized or acknowledged uh, government of, Af of Afghanistan, the recognized government of Afghanistan? Is there an implicit legitimization of the Taliban by virtue of this? There's lots of questions around that that need to be asked. I believe that it can be a very profound means of accountability. But again, in talking about it, we just need to be clear-eyed and make sure, from my perspective, that the women's voices lead those efforts. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm your far for your comprehensive laying of the ground. Uh, you posed the question to Nushin Sarkarati. Nushin, could you continue the conversation? Great. Thank you so much, Catherine, for raising that. Um, essentially, this campaign that we've been working on came about because although Afghan women have been calling, using the term gender apartheid since 1998, is the earliest I was able to see, we didn't see any movement around codifying the language around gender apartheid, uh, which is clearly essential. Uh, even though we have gender persecution, which is really important that we have this crime, uh, victims were still calling for recognition of gender apartheid because this is a distinct crime. And just as we have racial apartheid and racial persecution coexisting in various international treaties, it was clearly important to also have gender apartheid. 
So our team at the Atlantic Council Strategic Litigation Project work, worked on identifying a legal route to codification. And because right now the UN Sixth Committee is looking at a draft treaty on crimes against humanity, which includes racial apartheid and gender persecution as a crime against humanity, we saw this as a key opportunity to raise that gender apartheid should be defined as a crime against humanity in this treaty. So we worked with Afghan women, Iranian women, international jurists, uh, South African jurists who are quite important to this conversation since apartheid originated in South Africa uh, to, put to, to put together this legal brief and effort to really engage the UN on how this is the opportune moment. This is the time we need to see to actually codify this language. We can't allow decades to continue where people are using the term gender apartheid uh, without actually having any legal weight uh, behind recognition of that term. Uh, my colleague, Sarita Ashraf, uh, who is on the panel today, led the drafting of this brief and can really go further into the detail of this definition and how we really see this as complementary to the gender persecution effort. Um, but really, we need to take this moment to actually see codification so that there can actually be action be action brought against the state of uh, states like Afghanistan uh, for gender apartheid, not simply that we are calling it out in only our policies. Um, but maybe I can allow Sarita to go further into our legal brief and some of the details of that. Now, I'll just take this opportunity. Thanks so much for, for having me. As, as Nusheen um, said, one of the reasons that we, we identify the crimes against humanity treaty discussions is it created an opening to codify a crime that was already being recognized by the victims and survivors of the crime itself. Um, and so what we are looking at essentially is this understanding of um, the need to recognize a crime as a core, and I would say um, uh, essential step to preventing and punishing that crime. Um, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to um, to build momentum and then to take action to prevent and punish crimes if that existence of that crime is still being debated. We're speaking more and more often today about the idea of survivor-centered forms of justice. And in the um, in the consultations that the Atlantic Council Street Litigation Project did with a wide range um, of people from different backgrounds, from different genders, um, they, it was clear that this is a crime that one, they they believe that they had been impacted by. Some of them were not aware that it was not in fact a recognized crime um, and that it, it, they, they needed to move it forward as part of the process of preventing and punishment. Also recognizing a crime, codification of crime opens up other avenues. It opens up, certainly opens up legal avenues, but it also opens up further diplomatic and political space in which to take action. And so it's, it's the importance of codification extends simply beyond, beyond um, widening and creating new legal pathways. So one of the questions that we, we get a lot is, um, how is this crime different to other crimes? Why do you need another crime? Um, that is a crime, that is a conversation actually you find very specifically happening when it's crimes which are perceived to be more likely to impact women and, and girls. Um, it's not a crime that was discussed during the discussion of um, racial apartheid and race-based persecution, but there is this conversation about about uh, the seriousness with which we investigate, prosecute, and even codify crimes is really, I think, often linked to the seriousness with which we take the harm to the victims and the the, um, the importance we place on the victims in the societies. And when it comes to crimes which are seen as being more directly impacting or more directly relevant, particularly um, to women and girls, although the crime of gender apartheid extends far beyond women and girls and may impact on anyone of any gender, including um, men and boys, um, that therefore we are um, we, we are now calling into question the need for it. So I think you're right in the sense that we need to look at the surrounding dynamics. Those aren't also political dynamics. Those are also gender dynamics and the way in which we're signaling what harms we're taking seriously and what harms we are willing to extend ourselves to really see and understand. I'm just gonna speak very briefly about the unique aspects of the crime of gender apartheid. And it has two unique aspects. Um, first is its um, very distinct animating context. And the second is its intent. Um, it is a crime of sweeping dysutopian vision. And through its commission, its perpetrators seek to 
uh, establish and then maintain a form of governance designed to systematically oppress and dominate a subset of society so that the dominant group may live alongside them and benefit from their subjugation. Um, it is the, it is designed to endure. It is an ideologically based governance project which is designed to endure by excising, by removing a part of the population under the perpetrator's control from political life, from economic life, from social life, to such a degree that with the remnants of their own resources and freedoms that may remain, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for them to organize to or overcome their own orchestrated um, oppression. And so one of the things that is very unique about gen gender apartheid and about apartheid systems on the whole, whether that is race or gender based, is that it's really, we're really looking at the architecture of oppression, an institutionalized regime of oppression that is that people find themselves suddenly um, trapped in. Um, uh, and uh, and and de trapped in and dehumanized by, cut off from um, the possibility of full personhood or being granted full um, human dignity. As a result, apartheid systems have a tendency to invite and provoke public and private violence against members of their crest group, and also to cut them off from avenues of accountability um, domestically within the apartheid regime systems. The second is that it's intent, and I, and apartheid um, is is fairly unique. There's only a, another crime which has such a sweeping dystopian provision, which is, I would say, the crime of genocide, um, in that it is the crime of intent. The person who commits an apartheid crime, gender apartheid crime, commits an inhumane act with the intent of maintaining a regime of systematic, an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination. That is the intent by which they commit the act, and it is, in fact, the intent which permeates the crime. Um, and so it is really important to understand that this is the driving force of someone who commits the crime of, of apartheid, gender or race-based apartheid. Um, when it comes to that, I think it's really also important to highlight that often we speak about gender apartheid in terms of women and girls. Uh, and there's a good reason for that, I think, that women and girls uh, are not a minority. They're in, a, in some ways an oppressed majority. We see a very um, um, glaring, uh, painful examples and, and, and long-term examples of, of um, deepening oppression of women, of women and girls in systems which can be properly characterized as apartheid systems. However, the crime is committed as, as drafted, uh, as the, as the um, legal brief um, has, has placed the, 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 the draft of the crime, which is a, a, an amendment to the original crime of, of apartheid as set out in the Rome Statute. Um, the crime is committed when someone commits an inhumane act with the intent of um, maintaining that institutionalized regime. It doesn't indicate who is um, committing the act. It also doesn't indicate who the act is committed against. So it is possible, for example, if in a system where girls' education was being um, was not being permitted, that you might have a man who stands up as an ally, even though he himself is technically one of the beneficiaries of a regime of institutionalized oppression, and stands up for um, for for girls' education or some other aspect of of female agency or autonomy, and suffers beatings or or, or potentially uh, um, lethal violence, lethal force being used against him. Technically, he would be a victim of an inhumane act is being committed against them, that inhumane act is being committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. So I think it's also really important not to um, invest very hard in binaries when it comes to the crime of gender apartheid. Of course, there may be reasons that we focus on particular victims because of a particular geopolitical situation, but this is a crime that has emerged in the past. It will, a crime that, it will be a crime that will reemerge in the future. And one of the things that we realize is the international legal system's capacity to prevent the crime, to punish the crime, even really to, to render the crime visible as it's occurring in front of us, requires some level of the recognition of the crime. Um, and that includes a under thorough understanding of the particular legal dimensions of the crime, which I hope I've helped with in a very short way. Um, so I'm going to hand the floor, floor back over to the moderator to continue the discussion.
I can't hear anything. Hello, belatedly. Um, I now want to turn to uh, Professor Rangita de Alvas, uh, who, as I indicated, is an expert uh, uh, on UN conventions on elimination of discrimination. Could you continue the conversation along the line of the international legal instruments that can be used to enhance women's rights and empowerment for women? Thank you. So given the long shadow that has been cast over the day, I remind myself often that the arc of the model universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So I hope that today's conversation really lends itself to the arc bending towards justice. I want to first and foremost take this opportunity to address two of the pushbacks that I myself have uh, received in terms of the conceptualizing of gender apartheid. So first is the fact that apartheid, the term itself, is located within a certain historic moment. And I want to demystify that sacred moment and connect it to this current moment. So first, while South African laws, including the Bantu Education Act of 1953, impose segregation and inadequate funding on non-white schools, the Taliban itself has effectively instituted a total ban on the education of girls and women in Afghanistan. Second on employment, the Taliban's restrictions on women's employment parallel the South Africa's Job Reservation Act, which effectively excluded non-white individuals from skilled and semi-skilled jobs. And then thirdly, while South Africa's pass law was required to be carried along with the registration in order to be legally permitted outside their homes, Afghan women are obliged to carry with them a marum in public, to be accompanied by a marum in public. The second pushback or challenge that I have often received is that, um, that what happens in Afghanistan is in the name of culture. What I want to make clear is that this is not culture, but a moral perversion. We need to avoid falling into the trap of cultural relativism. And this is something that was raised earlier in the morning, that somehow some women in some places, because of some cultural differences, have different standards of justice, including unequal rights for women. Now, this is an intellectual conceit that we need to avoid. And how can we ensure and how can we implement the fact that Article 18, uh, the General Comment Number 28 of the Human Rights Committee on Article 18 of the ICCPR makes it clear that guarantees of freedom of religion or belief may not be relied upon to justify discrimination against women. And there's moral clarity uh, in that regard. I want to now go to answering your question about the efficacy of the CEDO. And my colleague and friend, Catherine, too, spoke about it. And what I want to make clear is that, you know, there are different proposals to litigate at the IC ICJ um, using the CEDO, and it may mark a historic milestone in advancing women's rights globally. And I look to leaders like Catherine to lead that uh, litigation initiative. I wanted to also, um, also share with you that we need a coordinated approach, which involves not just the ICJ, but universal jurisdiction, especially um, as uh, Nahid reminded us, there's still no travel ban against the Taliban. So here is a place where universal jurisdiction could come into play. We could also use the CEDO treaty body in very creative manners, and I will talk about the ways in which we are using the treaty body's own jurisprudence and soft law creation uh, methodologies to address both gender persecution and gender apartheid. So at the CEDAW's 87th session, I am happy to report to my distinguished colleagues who are gathered here in Massey College that in my constructive dialogue with Tajikistan, which is the country bordering Afghanistan, that I uh, stated that the committee is concerned that any kind of non-refoulement of uh, Afghan women 
back to Afghanistan may expose women to a violation of most rights under the convention as they are compelled to return to a country where an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression by the de facto authorities may be characterized as gender apartheid. Now, this is the first time where a treaty body in their constructive dialogues invoked the term gender apartheid. And because our concluding observations constitute soft law creation in the concluding observations on the women, peace and security agenda, I did include and with the committee's own um, deliberations and consent that um, that the committee would be concerned if Afghan women are compelled to return to a country where an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression by the de facto authorities may be characterized as gender persecution. We are also in the process of drafting the general recommendation 40 on women's leadership. And given the fact that what we see in Afghanistan is an erasure of women in public and political life, this extreme form of oppression is antithetical to all of the articles of the CEDAW, but in our new jurisprudence on General Recommendation 40, we have made this central. So I want us to understand that I, we will continue to invoke gender persecution and gender apartheid in our constructive dialogues with state parties and when relevant, include it in our concluding observations. Now, I want to go back very quickly to Catherine's comments on the proposal to litigate at the ICJ, which, mark, which would mark a historic milestone and what that would really um, create in terms of indirect, uh, indirect impact on our efforts to address gender apartheid. So litigation at the ICJ could lead to the issuance of provisional measures such as obligatory temporary uh, protective or injunctive relief where the court could evaluate uh, the admissibility and the merits of the case and that these measures might involve immediate actions like ordering the return of girls to secondary schools. Um, it would also help uh, provide uh, Afghan women a new platform, a powerful platform to assert their rights under international law, amplify their grievances and raise awareness on a global scale. And the proposed litigation might be able to deter conditional recognition of the Taliban, which we are all very worried about. And the proposed litigation would strengthen diplomatic efforts to improve the situation of Afghanistan. But as Catherine said, there are concerns that this might lead to the legitimacy of the Taliban, the de facto authorities, but I think it might be important that uh, we uh, make it clear that this does not require recognizing the Taliban's legitimacy, rather it would signify the acknowledgement that the violations of CEDAW are taking place within Afghan territory and previous cases such as Ethiopia versus South Africa and Liberia versus South Africa demonstrated that states can initiate proceedings against a state without recognizing its government as was seen in apartheid South Africa. So in conclusion, I want to remind ourselves again, given the importance, the momentous importance of this day that Nelson Mandela, who was the father of anti-apartheid, has reminded us that there is no such thing as part freedom. So there is no such thing as imperfect freedom, either in Iran or in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rangita. And now we turn to Professor Rebecca Cook. Professor Cook. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk about the importance of this term gender apartheid. And I've read the legal brief and I think it's extremely interesting approach. My only question about that is right now it's in draft form. And as Rangita mentioned, we do have a contentious jurisdiction under the CEDAW convention. 
And my research has been with Sophia Moreau, a legal philosopher, on what do we mean by systemic discrimination? So what we are trying to do is look at the jurisprudence that's been that's come out of the inquiry procedure and how this committee has looked at the meaning of gender discrimination as systemic. And very interestingly enough, some of the elements that, and particularly in the contextual part, certainly not in the intentional part, of the crime, of uh, the definition of the crime of gender apartheid resonates with some of the jurisprudence that's coming out of the committee on systemic discrimination. So what they do with the with uh, requests for an inquiry procedure is they apply a certain standard. It requires a discrimination of an organized nature, deliberate, persistent uh, degradation of women. Um, so I think there's a lot in that jurisprudence that could be very interesting to bringing a contentious case under the CEDAW convention that really merits uh, investigation. I think as a general matter, international discrimination law has been fixated on the grounds of discrimination. And what uh, Sophia Moreau's work has illuminated for me is the importance of moving from a grounds-based discrimination to a wrongs-based discrimination. What is the wrong of discrimination? And frankly uh, put, we have not focused in international uh, discrimination law on the, the wrongs of discrimination and how we might articulate that. And certainly uh, a wrong of discrimination is its systemic and its structural forms. And what I'm very encouraged by is some of the uh, normative development under CEDAW under their inquiry procedure. In addition, there is a whole conversation going on worldwide by, um, by legal philosophers on discrimination. And I think we can borrow from that in very illuminating ways. For example, Sophia Moreau's work um, talks about a pluralist theory of discrimination, where she moves from grounds-based to a focus on wrongs-based discrimination. What does it mean to unfairly subordinate some people to others? Uh, what does it mean to deny some people deliberative freedoms? And here, of course, we're talking about women and girls. Wh what does it mean where we leave some people without access to a basic good? And certainly, the, uh, as was pointed out earlier in today's discussion, is the uh, really the crumbling of some of the institutions in, in Afghanistan. I'm most familiar with the healthcare institutions, which will lead to um, a mater a increase in maternal mortality, all of which could be preventable. So I think I refer back to what Richard um, Bennett said about an all tools approach. Um, there are pros and cons to each of these approaches, but I don't. I think we should explore all of them with a, a view to going full steam ahead with an all tools approach. Thank you. Much. Uh, now I want to turn to the uh, member of the aud audience in person. Uh, any questions that you want to pose to our distinguished panel? Yes, please. What do you do with the the um, What do you do if the institutions by which you've been afforded to try and make those changes are themselves, for lack of a better word, in cahoots with the states that are uh, committing those crimes that are subjugating women, that are denigrating women. Uh, like, for instance, the uh, United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Rights, uh, Nada al Nashif, was begged by so many Iranian human rights organizations back in uh, early February to not go to Iran and sit in on meetings and 
when she was there, she didn't meet with any prisoners. She didn't meet with any activists. The families of PS752 actually went in front of the courthouse where she was meeting with people, protested. The police came out and, and um, were against them. And there was no response even from Nada al Nashif. And I know that no one here is from the UN and can't answer that. But what do you do as, as people who are trying to make change within that framework to combat that? Very good question. You want to take that? Sure. I, I think that what you've described so, so well is part of the incrementalism of international law where there are um, there is a basic inertia in some aspects of the system in meeting the facts where they are and that's the classic issue of engagement versus non-engagement can the islamic engagement with the islamic republic government better the situation for citizens or is it really one of complete non-engagement as a punitive and sanctions matter and those are obviously the tilt of that can differ over time, but those are some of the basic considerations as, as many colleagues as I know who work in the UN, are they legitimizing, are they facilitating, or they move to, to condemnation? So I don't pretend that this is easy, but I think that incrementalism in, in that inertia can be part of it. But the other aspect of it is this understanding and continuing to push does bear fruit. And I'll give you an example. So for example, the um, International Law Commission, which is a very important body in the UN system for purposes of codification and development of international law, had a special rapporteur um, devoted to the idea of use kogans. And use kogans, and that was Dire Tladi. And Dire Tladi wrote this report about use kogans, and use kogans being the highest order norms has the, the classic prohibitions against racial discrimination, against slavery, against torture, against arbitrary detention. Those were all included in his report. And he also included discrimination on the basis of gender. Now that did not make it into the um, ultimate ILC report. And this is one of those examples of where it can be a situation where compromise and dilution results in rights not having the strength that they need to on the international plane. At the same time, this special rapporteur is now on the International Court of Justice. <laughs> and so there is a benefit to talking and pushing and advocating and demonstrating, even if in the short term, you know, that you don't get exactly what that objective achieves, in the sense that, again, again, together, we are able to push as many of these different mm -hmm. points of leverage in order to get the change that we want. And so I, I take that frustration, but I also see where in continuing to push, we are making differences, including in the context of very important context of the crimes against humanity. Trade. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, the, any uh, additional response from our colleagues online? If um, not, yes, please. Um, yes, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot that can be done in the shadow of the law. And those are the kinds of uh, initiatives that I think Rebecca Cook also mentioned, that this is you know, all tools, uh, all tools uh, approach to addressing both gender apartheid and gender persecution. I want to also remind ourselves that Judge Shahabuddin, who was a judge on the ICTY appeals chamber, underscored the importance of being able to reflect full culpability in international criminal law. And he said to convict of one offense only is to leave unnoticed the true extent of the criminal conduct of the accused. So I think, you know, I want to underscore that the crime of gender persecution alone cannot and does not capture gender apartheid. So it is important for, uh, you know, UN agencies, as was mentioned earlier, there seems to be a sense of um, how to act and inaction is almost complicity. So, you know, as part of a treaty body, we do have a charge, a moral authority to speak up and to speak up against kind of, uh, crimes that uh, that render women subordinate at every level in uh, in the human condition thank you thank you very much rangita uh if any other replies if not we go to one last question please you're there 
Oh. Okay, thank you. So um, I think I heard somebody say that they've been speaking to Afghan women. And I, whenever somebody says that, I wonder what's the mechanism that these organizations actually get a hold of these women, especially because, especially in Afghanistan, Hazara women, uh, other minorities, uh, do not have mechanisms in which they can just contact. Um, oh, it's gone. Yeah, okay, like they can just contact um, organizations and talk to them about their specific uh, experiences in Afghanistan. So I just was wondering, what's the mechanism that, I think it was Nosheen that um, said that she spoke to um, uh, Afghan, Afghan women, like what's the mechanism that you are gathering these women and how do you make sure that you have a more, uh, I guess, co uh, inclusive and broader um, idea of what women very good. in Afghanistan are going through? Thank, Thank you very you. much. Nushin, you want to respond to that? Please. Thank you so much for raising this. Um, my two colleagues who are not here today, um, Azadiraz Mohammed and Mitra Mehran, are doing a lot to engage um, Afghan women, both within country and outside, uh, on the concept of gender apartheid. We did hold several roundtables. There was representatives from the Hazara community in the roundtable. Uh, We've also listed the Afghan women who are part of our legal brief who were able to be public um, in the brief. So you can see some of their names there and some of them were even key signatories. But of course, it's so dangerous uh, for groups like ours to be engaging with women on the ground on the ground and it does remain a problem. I know that there are a lot of efforts right now to bring different Afghan voices together. I know, um, I believe Catherine is organizing some effort to engage with Afghan women more broadly. Um, there are a lot of coalitions that have, been, that have been formed on this and it must be quite exhausting for all the Afghan women to be consistently part of these briefings that they contribute to, but it really is important that we do engage as best as possible um, to ensure that the definition we're putting forward really does um, comply with what we're seeing on the ground in Afghanistan. Um, so it is really important that we continue these coalitions as best as possible and that lawyers such as myself um, engage with those coalitions that are forming, uh, pushing for gender apartheid and ensure that they are part of the briefings that we're doing uh, when we're engaging the UN or international bodies or elsewhere. What a fascinating panel. Please join me to thank distinguished members of our panel. And unfortunately, we are out of luck, please. Uh, as I said constantly, we could have had a one week long conference, but this has been an extraordinary panelist once again. Uh, we thank very valuable contributions and thank you very much, Mohammed, for your capable um, chairing. Uh, and I also take the opportunity once again to thank uh, Catherine Amir Fair and Deborah Voisin Plimpton for having sponsored and, and supported this. Uh, conference. So um, we now um, have a short coffee break of 15 minutes and we will be back for the final panel on international response and solidarity. Thank you. And let me